get a start for the uh, second part of it with Peter Pascoe. Um, normally there's a little uh, resume of their uh, background, but uh, Peter's I found hard to find. If I looked at some seminar papers, there were out profiles of presenters, but Peter's was never there. But he has given me this, which I found most interesting. He came to the bar in 1988 and has developed a specialist practice in the area of wills, estates, probate, testator family maintenance, equity trusts and superannuation. And he is a nationally accredited mediator. Prior to 1998, Peter served as a private secretary to the Commonwealth Attorney General, who at that stage was Gareth Evans. He has been a senior lecturer in the Department of Law at Swinburne University, has practised as a CPA and also as a solicitor, having done articles in that old firm of Ellison, Hewison and Whitehead. So, Peter, I do invite you to address the uh, topic of intestacy and uh, questions will follow your paper. Good morning and uh, welcome. It's um, summer, I'm told, but it's, it's quite chilly out there, as you know, and even chillier there in the uh, front desk. We seem to be under a draft. But um, I'm not quite sure how I came to be speaking here this morning to you on the uh, subject of intestacy. Um, I certainly know, and uh, where is Michael, my clerk? Um, oh, there he is. Um, I certainly know I was double booked and uh, in another seminar that also started at this ungodly hour of 7.30 in the morning. And um, as all good barristers do when their clerk commanded them to uh, um, cease being elsewhere and attend here, um, yes, well, here I am. Um, again, how I came to be speaking about intestacy, um, I think I... Um, flipped a coin twice with Simon and uh, um, I think I probably won the first in that I wasn't the first speaker but I lost the second because he, he took the sexy topic um, uh, and um, I'm left with intestacy. Um, we had a morning coffee, uh, David, Simon and I <clears throat> on, um, was it Monday or Tuesday? Tuesday I think it was and um, uh, David was just fantastic. Uh, he's been very assiduous in performing his uh, duties as, uh, as chair for this morning's session. Um, so he was asking all manner of embarrassing questions about, um, um, about my lack of biomaterial amongst others, which he's just highlighted. Um, but um, there were other good um, matters that came out of the, uh, the discussion and um, um, one of them uh, I'll refer to in a moment when I get into my paper. Um, but the subject of intestacy uh, Obviously, it's been um, a matter that uh, has occupied uh, the um, Victorian Law Reform Commission as part of its uh, report on succession laws. And uh, it's one of those sorts of areas where, as practitioners, we need to uh, address, um, but perhaps infrequently. Um, but nonetheless, um, it is uh, an important and difficult area um, I recall doing an application before um, a Supreme Court judge um, on what's called a Benjamin order, and uh, the judge wasn't um, someone who was well versed in um, matters of, um, of equity and probate, and in passing I had to refer to some of the aspects of, um, of the intestacy provisions because uh, Benjamin orders um, require genealogical surveys and uh, and. Uh, traces of next of kin and um, lo and behold um, his honour asked me to uh, to hand up um, some of the provisions relating to intestacy and take him through them uh, which filled me with horror um, but um, my horror was sort of um, a factor of 10 to his honour when um, he started to uh, try and uh, wend his way through those provisions. So it is an area that's complex um, it's not well drafted, it is in need of uh, drastic reform and um, if succession laws are reformed um, in the course of this parliament and that of course remains a question um, given the uh, current uh, political um, environment in which the government <coughs> is operating, um, intestacy law um, would be ripe for um, some changes and um, it's my task today to try and just briefly um, take you through uh, what has been suggested um, by the Commission. To uh, start off um, on the um, 
material that I've handed out this morning, and uh, I thank Luke from Green's office for coming in at some ungodly hour before 7.30 and, uh, and running off copies for you. Um, I've just referred under the heading of intestacy to um, something that I've picked up over time that always done <coughs> brought a bit of a chuckle to me. Um, it's the statutory provisions, um, and they constitute an act of parliament uh, um, that really brings into uh, place a parliamentary will made for a person on his birth, <coughs> which he may modify by gifts into vivos or by a duly executed will. And um, he, of course, can be he or she. And the authority for that, uh, that quote is, um, and don't we equity probate lawyers love going back into time, it's uh, 1727. So mm -hmm. there we are. And still, I'm repeating it here today in 2014. So as I said earlier, um, somewhat of a rarity in our practice, but uh, nonetheless, uh, the succession uh, paper reports that there were between 1,300 and 1,400 intestate um, estates in respect of which grants of letters were made um, in uh, Victoria within the last uh, reference period. They didn't exactly specify the time period, but um, and, and I don't have the comparative figures to, uh, to compare that with uh, grants uh, of um, probate in respect of wills, but it's a smallish number, it seems to me. So with that sort of setting, um, let's have a look at uh, the way in which um, intestacy uh, usually occurs. And I've split those up as between uh, total intestacy on the one hand and um, partial intestacy, obviously, on the other. In discussing matters over a coffee with uh, David and Simon on Tuesday, um, uh, David gave me a clue as to how I might conveniently um, explain a total intestacy, um, because what can happen is, as I've described it in 3.1.1, um, the omen phenomenon. Um, that is a person who says, if I make a will, it will be a bad omen. It will be an omen for my foreboding death. And I therefore absolutely refuse to make a will. If I make a will, I'm going to die. I am not being fanciful. I am not being humorous. This occurs as a matter of attitude to life uh, or thought of impending death. Speaking to David very briefly, just before I rose to speak, um, David also mentioned um, family history as being a factor giving rise to a total intestacy. You just never make a will. And you're in good company because no one in your family has ever made one and you're going to continue that fantastic tradition. Um, curious, but uh, nonetheless, um, it, uh, it is a matter of fact. And then uh, uh, to take a uh, quote, I think, uh, that I can attribute to um, my clerk, Michael Green, and I think I've got it right, it goes along 3.1.2. Inertia is a powerful force in life, or words to that effect. <laughs> and of course, he's um, not explaining his own, his own approach to life in making that comment. Um, so there are a couple of uh, uh, reasons or three reasons why you might have a total intestacy and um, of course um, uh, there are then um, a combination perhaps of those circumstances that I've referred to when I've taken some extracts from the Peter Brock case and um, you no doubt um, be aware of Peter Brock, his death and the case that gave rise to um, an advancement in our jurisprudence in relation to informal wills. But um, there's an important part of a judgment when it's dealing with those uh, matters that um, could potentially have been uh, proven as uh, informal instruments. And um, the second of them was the so-called 2003 will. And so what I've set out uh, there for you is the evidence that Her Honour Justice Hollingsworth um, uh, found and recorded in a judgment uh, relating to um, that particular matter. And it, it just pays um, a, a quick read. Um, Ms Brock um, is a reference to uh, Beverly Brock, who was uh, Peter Brock's uh, former long-term 
domestic partner. She took his name, but they'd never formally married. Um, and she suggested, and she had on numerous occasions, that Peter update his will to take account of his um, changed personal circumstances, including the death of his parents. Um, he was in a family relationship where um, uh, Ms Brock had one child from a previous relationship and they had two of their own. So according to Bev Brock, Peter was a person who had a cavalier attitude to anything legal and financial and expressed the view that, well, as he was not going to be around after he died, he had nothing to worry about. And again, that's um, symptomatic of, of those who are careless about these sort of responsibilities. Um, her evidence then was... Um, so when I raised the topic of a new will, I inevitably had to explain to Peter that I would have to resolve the mess should he die before me and asked him to help me. And I'm paraphrasing, I'm not reading verbatim. So as so many do, who um, perhaps are the cause of either, uh, perhaps not total, but uh, partial intestacies, um, Bev Brock bought a do-it-yourself will kit. And that was at Peter's request. Um, they then met together with uh, Peter's then secretary, Sandra Williams, and uh, <coughs> they uh, sat down to discuss completing the, uh, the will kit. And um, what Peter did at that stage was, in his own handwriting, which was unusual, to fill in details um, as testator, um, the appointment of um, uh, Mrs. Uh, Darker and uh, Keogh, and I think from memory... Um, uh, Mr. Darker was an accountant and uh, Jim Keogh is certainly a lawyer well known to many um, and they were to be his executors with uh, his daughter Alexandra as uh, an alternate executor and um, he stated his wish that he uh, be cremated and his ashes be um, scattered at the top of the hill. And now um, he left blank those parts of his will, will kit, that were dispositive. He simply said to um, uh, Bev Brock, um, he trusted her completely and uh, she could um, uh, fill in um, when he died whatever she considered appropriate. Now, that was um, a trusting delegation, but um, again, it's, uh, it's a total um, dereliction of uh, responsibilities. But she said, look, she wasn't su surprised by that because he liked to take care of the big stuff the motor racing, the sponsorships, and all of this was just the miniature of life um, that he could leave to others. Um, it was then uh, signed by Sandra Williams um, as a, a witness. Um, Bev Brock didn't witness the will and it was then put into a filing cabinet. Now, Her Honour, when um, she was um, addressing the evidence, um, obviously um, spoke about the fact that um, it uh, could, um, that particular document, uh, could have legal effect and, and did have legal effect of revoking a 1984 will um, and it went on to appoint executors um, but it contained no dispositive provisions as I've just mentioned with the result that there was a total intestacy. So there you see another take on the same outcome. And strangely enough of the three as I recall it possible documents that could be admitted to probate as informal instruments it was this 1983 will with no dispositive provisions that was the document that was admitted and that gave rise to um, a good number of uh, part four claims. So um, a cavalier attitude um, gave rise to um, lots of fees for the legal profession, lots of angst for many of his um, family and um, um, ultimately all matters were resolved. Um, so, what I've um, done, having shown you um, circumstances that have given rise to a total intestacy there, is simply to move on to partial intestacy. And um, again, there are a number of ways in which these sorts of uh, things occur, but again, drawing on something that David was talking about before, sometimes it's just the unfortunate turn of events so that the way life turns out, the order in which people die, um, the residuary clause doesn't have sufficient reach. And so um, there's um, a total, oh, sorry, a partial intestacy um, picking up the, uh, the residue. Specific provisions have dealt with some uh, uh, specific items of uh, real and or personal property. 
but if there isn't sufficient reach of the residuary clause, um, then there may be a partial intestacy. Now, that's really just a bit of fine tuning for concepts that are well known. The um, aspect that uh, is of um, greater uh, current interest is what the um, Law Reform Commission has proposed um, by way of reform of uh, this complicated um, area of, uh, of our succession law. What I've done to uh, try and make it uh, manageable is I've, I've put it into uh, matrix or tabular form and um, I've provided uh, four columns, um, the first dealing with, as I've described it, the party, the second are their entitlement under the Administration and Probate Act as it currently is. I've then identified the section that um, uh, is the basis for that entitlement and I've then, um, in the fourth column, um, placed uh, adjacent to the relevant area um, the particular recommendations um, that might bring about change in that area. Um, I need to publicly acknowledge, um, firstly, the assistance of David in providing what was um, an equity trustee's uh, screed on the law as to uh, intestacy. It, it's quite old. I think it was back in 2004 from, from memory, David. Um, <clears throat> And it commenced with um, just a, a normal uh, description of various aspects of the law, then went into um, a tabular analysis of um, um, how um, the uh, intestacy on a particular occasion might be approached so far as entitlement was concerned. And I've drawn on that, but I've updated it and um, I've added my own, um, for example, the last two columns are uh, the third and the fourth column are entirely my own work, so I claim um, copyright in respect of it. Um, and um, it hasn't been um, plagiarism that's unattributed. Um, so we know uh, that if there's a partner uh, and no child or other issue, then they take the whole of the um, uh, intestate's residuary estate. Now, I have placed um, asterisks. Um, against uh, the word partner and the term uh, residuary estate and I've um, taken the trouble of defining those um, at the um, end of the, uh, the table um, and um, unless you've looked at it in recent times you wouldn't be familiar with the, the reach of, uh, of these sorts of things but um, of course uh, in part they're a response to the amendments brought about by the Relationships Act and uh, these concepts um, of um, registrable and uh, registered um, domestic partners and, um, and we'll come to uh, even a further extension of that term in a moment. But for the moment, shortly put, uh, a partner is uh, a person's spouse, that is a uh, legal um, husband or wife or domestic partner. Um, I won't take uh, the trouble of going into um, those matters any further for this um, present uh, purpose because um, time is, is slipping by. Um, <clears throat> but what um, has been done uh, by the Commission is to recommend that there be um, no change in entitlement but the definition of partner be amended to include um, a registered caring partner that I have to find with a hashtag um, at the bottom of the table. And um, so uh, that would be um, um, a further aspect of the, uh, the word partner. And um, um, I'll take you in a moment to um, an anomaly in the present legislation where um, the registered caring partner does in fact have a, a role to play but is otherwise not within the definition of partner. Um, when we're talking about um, then if a partner has a child or children or other issue, and when we're referring to the phrase other issue, we're really there referring to um, descending generations and uh, representative um, takers. But we know that the uh, scheme that we currently have in place um, gives uh, to the partner then uh, personal chattels and all of the estate if it's uh, less than 100,000 and if it's more than 100,000 then the first 100,000 and interest at the rate fixed um, relevantly as I've described it from the time of death to the date of payment. 
That particular figure of $100,000 has been around now for a good time. I think it was um, uh, increased 100% by um, taking it to 100 from $50,000, but the um, Commission proposes that it be um, taken up to $350,000 and in an endeavour to stop it from being eroded by inflation um, to be uh, indexed to the consumer price index. The relevant um, allied change is to the interest and um, they've um, said that it ought to be calculated as from the first anniversary of the deceased death, that is not from the date of death, and be paid um, at the cash rate published by the Reserve Bank um, plus 2%. So there's a, a change in respect of, um, of that um, interest rate together with the um, what we'll call the statutory legacy to the partner. As we know, the partner um, gets a third of the balance um, and the recommendation from the Law Reform Commission is that that be expanded to one half. And so whereas uh, before or at current um, uh, legislation, two thirds goes to the child or children, um, that is going to be changed. And it's going to be changed significantly because what I've said um, in my uh, fourth column um, adjacent to uh, that particular entry um, is that um, ignoring the uh, ch children on ventre sur for the moment um, and just uh, looking to what I've highlighted in the uh, bolded uh, type, um, children of the deceased person will only take where there is a child of the deceased who is not a child of the surviving partner. So in other words, if a deceased dies and has a surviving partner and the deceased's only children are with that surviving partner, that surviving partner will take all. The children will not have the two-thirds entitlement that they presently do. It's only if there, are, there is uh, another child or other children of the deceased that are not children of that surviving partner that uh, the children will uh, take their... Uh, half under the, the new recommendation. So there are significant changes, increasing in the statutory legacy, um, increasing to what a half the uh, partner's share, but then really saying that that may be a, um, a surviving share that actually rises to 100% in the circumstances um, that I've outlined. Now, returning to this uh, matter of the registered caring partner and just um, explaining um, the uh, Delphic reference that I made before, at 1.3 um, there's a reference to um, <coughs> the uh, division of the partner's share if there are multiple partners, for want of a better, better term. And we're familiar with this. This is in Section 51, capital A of the, uh, the Act. And um, what uh, the updated law um, does there is to say that if there is, um, on the one hand, uh, a spouse or a registered domestic partner or a registered caring partner, and then, on the other hand, an unregistered domestic partner, so it's starting to get fairly complex, but hopefully I've made it uh, reasonably clear. Then you've got the partner share being divided according to the length of time that the unregistered domestic partner has lived with the deceased. And um, so the breakdown is if that, um, uh, if we use the term de facto, has lived um, with the deceased continuously before his or her death for less than four years, they take a third. If it's between four and five, their share bumps up to a half. If they get over five but less than six, then it becomes two thirds. And if they've hit six and over, then they take it all. That is the unregistered domestic partner. So um, what uh, we have got there is a reference in the current legislation to this concept of the registered caring partner that's taken from the Relationships Act as it's been amended. Um, and you recall when I was referring to it as my first um, uh, item under 1.1, um, the Commission had recommended that um, uh, that the definition of partner be um, expanded now for all purposes, not just for this distribution of the partner's share, but for all purposes to include this concept of the registered caring partner. 
Going back to this 1.3, what the Commission recommends is that um, instead of there being these sort of fairly arbitrary time divisions, um, there should be um, divisions in accordance with either a distribution agreement or a court order, or um, failing either of those two things equally between the multiple partners. All right, now um, I've dealt with uh, only partners and um, I haven't yet um, um, found my way into uh, children and um, beyond. Um, but what uh, we see as the table unfolds um, is really a meeting point so that if you are met with a situation of um, a spouse only, sorry, a partner only, then what I've said in relation to that in the tabular analysis is as far as you go. If you've got a spouse, sorry, partner and children, um, then um, you're into this area of the, the tabular analysis uh, which um, sets out the current law and the proposed changes. If neither of those things are the case, then um, item three relates to parents. And if neither of the first two plus parents are the case, then you look to brothers and sisters and so on you go and you meet each situation as the circumstances of the family are presented um, to you. And that helps to uh, sort out the, um, the basis and help you understand what is difficult and, and not uh, easily understood legislation. But if I can speak broadly about it, time being what it is, um, we're familiar with the idea of the taker by representative capacity. So that, for example, you're looking to um, um, children uh, taking, but if a child has predeceased, then the children of the children, that is the grandchildren taking per stirpes, uh, the deceased child share. And uh, most of the representative um, outcomes are per stirpes, through the branches, per the stock. Um, and there's only one situation where there is a, a per capita outcome, and that's if um, all of the, um, uh, the deceased siblings have died, all of them have died, and so what you've got as takers are nephews and or nieces. And in a situation like that, you've got a per capita outcome. And what the Commission has done is to say, um, no, we're not going to um, put up with that anomaly. We're going to um, delete the per capita outcome in that situation and we're going to um, um, have per stirpes operate as the relevant basis for the distributions. So um, that's uh, uh, a, a quick way to deal with um, much of, uh, of that particular uh, area, but uh, track it through um, as and when you need to by all means um, use uh, this chart as a resource that might, might assist. Um, the important change that's really taking place when we're into this area is that, of course, as we know, we can get through all of those seven and yet not have met someone who is a taker with an entitlement. And then we're into the concept that's referred to there as um, remote and next of kin. And this is where I'm talking about things like genealogical studies research, Benjamin order applications, all of those sorts of things. These can be frustratingly difficult to nail down. They can be um, expensive to, uh, to undertake. And what the Commission has done is to say, um, we're going to draw a line and remoter next of kin is not going to be potentially open-ended. We are going to draw a line at first cousins. And that will be the end point. There will need to be no further research undertaken beyond that. There can be no takers beyond first cousins. First cousins are those in what's called the fourth degree of relationship. Everything else prior to, uh, to that is in the third degree of the relationship. And um, so the, um, the um, Commission has, uh, has sought to, uh, uh, to try and, as I say, uh, put that um, uh, cap on the uh, degrees of remoter next of kin. Now, the, um, of course, there will be cases where there is uh, no next of kin, and we're then familiar with the phrase uh, bona vacantia, um, or it goes to the crown, and that's something that generally brings tears to our eyes. 
um, um, it's not something that we um, look to uh, as a good outcome. But I just draw your attention to, uh, and it perhaps is little known in the profession, but there is a provision in the Financial Management Act where the Minister, uh, the Minister being the Minister of Finance, um, may distribute the property to um, any person um, who was dependent on the deceased or might reasonably have been expected to have been a, a recipient of provision. Um, and um, the Minister of the Crown, therefore, uh, to some extent, plays a, a court-like role. So they are the, um, the main um, aspects of the Commission's report. But if I can just take you to um, the last table on the material that I've provided, and that's um, the table uh, of distribution on the intestacy um, that underscores this limit being set at first cousins. And so just to explain the table um, so that if you're looking at it later in more detail, um, you, you may more readily appreciate it. Um, we're assuming a deceased, and then what we're doing successively as we go through the tables from um, my left to my right, going from numbers one to two to three to four to five, um, is you're looking to who would take in those circumstances. Okay, so you can see table one, for example, you're looking down a, a descending lineal um, order of, of children and uh, grandchildren and remoter issue. Um, if there are no such children or lineal descendants, then parents moving to three. If there are no persons in one and two, then you're looking to um, the takers as being set out in three and so on successively. I'll, I'll end um, my um, brief summation with a reference to um, a full set of recommendations that I've put um, just taken uh, verbatim from the uh, report um, relating to the, um, the surviving partner's uh, right to acquire or right to elect to acquire um, the deceased interest in a shared home. That's going to be expanded um, in accordance with the detailed recommendations set out there at 23 to 28. And I'll end on this note. Um, sometimes when we um, look to uh, intestacies, we are confronted with um, the rules as to bringing into account or bringing into hodgepodge um, advancements um, or settlements um, in respect of uh, children of the deceased who uh, may have received those during life. Um, for various reasons, and it's a quick uh, discussion in the uh, material, the uh, Commission has decided to remove those so that there will be no adjustments by way of hodgepodge. And that's sort of relevant to the will-making clauses where in much modern drafting we will include adjustment clauses um, and, and our clients will have deliberately instructed us that that's what they want. They want adjustments to bring into account all benefits that have been received by their um, beneficiaries during life. But here we're moving in the other direction in intestacy law so that those delightful aspects of hodgepodge may no longer be with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. I think we've run out of time for questions, um, although perhaps if there's one question, anybody got any questions? He's obviously researched that very well and it's not an easy topic to address. Um, just a couple of things. Um, it was my father-in-law who was superstitious who would not make a will and he died intestate. And the other ones are homemade wills which are the course of uh, undisposed property and, uh, where you get these intestacies. Um, just a, one other thing, I've had two recently and I've had to use Sue Macbeth to uh, trace the genealogical tree and she's very good. So if anybody wants to trace relatives or witnesses to wills, Sue Macbeth is very good. Um, from Michael Green's office, I've been asked to mention that there's a third uh, seminar on Thursday the 6th of March, most of which you probably subscribe to, and that's um, Powers of Attorney, Redemption and Guardianship and Administration, chaired by Georgina Gregoriou and presented by John Nunns and Eleanor Coates. And there's also some um, professional skills and practice management series coming up on March the 13th, 20th and 26th. 
And can I take this opportunity, Michael, to say, from being a non-member of the bar and being here, to say thank you for the presentation of your series of seminars. I think they're most helpful, and we get a lot out of it, apart from the point for attending. I think we get, it helps out in our practice to be kept up to date. So, Michael, thank you very much. And can you please... Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Can you please again thank Simon and Peter for the presentation of their papers this morning?